On behalf of the board, I want to welcome everyone that's here tonight. This is a regular meeting of the Board of Trustees. Today is Monday, December the 14th, 2020. The time is now 7 p.m. I do call the meeting to order and declare that we have a quorum present. This afternoon, Mr. Alvarado will lead us in the pledges and Mr. Rector will lead us in an invocation. Please rise. Mm -hmm. you have given us to keep everyone safe. Lord, we know you take care of your children, so we are grateful for your blessings. We come praying for all of us as we prepare to celebrate the birthday of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Help us to be mindful of the fact that Jesus is the reason for the season. We ask your blessings for in this meeting as we come to the close of this year. We ask all that we ask in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. For his sake we do pray. Amen. 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 Mr. Alvarado, Mr. Rector, <coughs> and on behalf of the board, I want to wish everybody a happy holiday. We won't see each other before Christmas. You know, it's been a challenging year, and we're looking forward to being with our families and spending that time together. So, we wish you a merry Christmas on behalf of the board. The first item on the agenda is agenda item number two: public testimony. Mr. Hayward? You can't while you're at the microphone. I think we can clean the microphone afterwards. If you'll just state your name and your address, please. Maybe one sorry. second. If you just give me one second, I can do some housekeeping. Uh, pursuant to board policy BED, the board will allow every person who wishes to address the board on an agenda item to do so before the board's consideration of the item. The board shall not deliberate regarding any subject that's not included on the agenda posted with notice of this meeting there is a time this is a time for the board to stop look and listen to public comments each speaker will be allowed three minutes to address the board we ask that speakers refrain from comments about any district employee by name without any proper due process Feel free to take the mic good evening good evening god bless guys i'm here on behalf of my wife and I just want to speak my mind. And I feel that um, if we're going to ask for our athletic director and head football coach to step down, because we, as a community, we felt that he didn't win. So I'm here today. I also feel that our girls coordinator, our head volleyball coach, she's been here for over 20 years. And in 20 years, she has not put up a winning record. And I feel that that our girls deserve the best. And right now she's not doing that. She hasn't done that. I've been able to, I've been blessed to go to the last three, three years and she's not done it. And I feel that our girls deserve better than that. If we're gonna ask the same thing for the boys, if we want what's best for the boys, then we also deserve, our girls deserve it. I'm the father of a daughter. And I expect my daughter to do, when she comes to school, do her classwork, behave, and bring home good grades, and she does that. And I also feel that when she's on that court, track, or baseball diamond, I expect for her to give me the best. And to me, I feel that her coaches, her volleyball coach is not doing that. And I think it's time for us to change. You know, I was born and raised here in Aransas, and I, I was blessed to be, to coach under Coach Davenport, and he taught me what winning is about. And I feel that our volleyball coach is not teaching our children that. She's not teaching our young ladies to, to win. You know, a lot of y'all guys went to football games and I spoke to a lot of y'all and y'all felt that the coaches didn't have that desire on the sideline to inspire our boys. Well, I went to every last one of our volleyball games and I don't see that coming out of her. To me, she doesn't inspire the, the girls to win. So I think it's time for change. And I'll say it again, if it's, 
what you're, we're asking as a community for our football coach and our athletic director, then I feel that it's time to change our girls' athletic coordinator and head volleyball coach. I mean, we can't ask for the best for the boys and throw the girls out. We can't do that. You know, I, I, I put my daughter on, I put my wife and my daughter on a pedestal. I want what's best for my wife and my daughter. And I've, I've had the opportunity to coach a lot of these young ladies. And me and, and the guys that I've coached, what we've instilled in those young ladies how to win. You have one minute left, Mr. And I just feel that it's time for change. And I know that we're, we're, get, we're looking for a new AD, and I know that the AD will have that opportunity to, to make that change. But I need to be here to voice my opinion that it's time for change for our girls. Thank you. Next is Frank Guzman. One second, Mr. Guzman. We're going to clean the uh, here. About Jesus. Amen. Just take it. Just, um, my name is Frank Guzman. I live at 2313 Oak Lane in Aransas Pass, Texas. Graduated high school, 89, class 89. Three children graduated high school here in Aransas Pass. Got grandchildren in the school. Have two nieces that I've been raising uh, in the high school also right now. Fixed to graduate this year. And I'm going to go right along with. Um, Coach Hayward here um, on the change, and this is from my experience with uh, the volleyball coach, and I just wanted to read something here um, right along with what Coach Hayward's saying. It is the coach's role to help athletes discover the, their own motivation to find their fire. It is the coach's role to inspire athletes to feel confident in themselves and to feel empowered to let their fire free. Motivation is a powerful ally for coaches and an important aspect of successful coaching. And from my experience with uh, the volleyball coach, my niece, circumstances beyond her control came to live with me in 2018 and we went through the process, UIL, to get her to be able to play varsity ball. She played varsity ball at Hardin County High School in Savannah, Tennessee as a sophomore, and we tried to make her where she could play varsity ball here. And through that process, we were able to do that, But and the coach told me that she was gonna put her on varsity, but she never did. And my niece, um, was upset with it, but she said, well, there's next year, I'll be a senior next year, I'll get to play varsity ball. And um, the coach told me she's gonna put her, put her on there as a junior, but she, she didn't, which to me, that was a lie to me. And then um, I was gonna confront her and my niece said no, because she was afraid of retaliation, that the coach would retaliate against her. So um, she started, varsity ball this year. Um, <clears throat> when my niece first came to live with me, she lied in bed for a month crying. You know, um, her confidence was destroyed because she was going through, half uprooted, moved somewhere new. And after the season started this year, she was right back in that bed crying again because she wasn't getting to play ball. So here's my name, one minute. And so um, she came to me and she wanted to quit. And I said, well, give it one more game. The coach is going to let you play. I went and watched her. She put her in twice the whole game for three matches for one volley each time. And I allowed her to quit. And I allowed her to um, quit athletics because of the retaliation factor. So um, I do believe that that wasn't building confidence in her, it was destroying her confidence in herself. And with that, I do believe that it's time for a change. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next, we have Jay Medina. Signs of the time, sorry. 
sorry. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm going to keep my mask on, save you a little bit of work after me. <laughs> um, so my name is Jay Medina. Um, I actually live at 2434 West Lake Circle North in Ingleside. Um, but my wife and I are both grad alumni from Rancis Pass. My wife's a teacher here at Charlie Marshall as well. Um, we chose to bring our to have our daughters come here because of the fact this is where we went to school. We like the academic program. We like the athletic program. So from our personal experiences, that's why we chose to bring her, bring them here as opposed to keep them in Ingleside, where we currently live. Um, what I want to speak on is, is briefly is on favoritism. Um, my daughter, during her varsity year volleyball this year, uh, did experience did have a negative experience regarding that. Um, <clears throat> her, to my understanding, her coach had instructed that mentioned to the students or to the players that they had basically two mistakes and on the court, and once they made a certain amount of mistakes, they were pulled out. My daughter made a couple mistakes; she got pulled out. And there were other players, and it's nothing against those other players because they're you know good, good athletes and they're given right. Made multiple mistakes and were kept on through several rotations when my daughter was essentially becoming a cheerleader on the court, on the on the bench, and that was it. She still was motivating her, her her team as well from the bench. She was still applauding them and everything, but it did have a negative effect on her at home. My daughter has been participating in competitive sports since she was five years old. She's never been one to, you know, let things get to her. She's been very resilient. Um, always perform well academically and athletically. So for her to get to the point where it caused her to question not only her ability as an athlete, but whether she even wanted to continue to be an athlete, you know, for this for this program or in general, that was something that we've never experienced. Um, in your mission statement up there, you have the words encourage, motivate, nurture, and inspire. That is something that not only is, is geared towards academic excellence, but also athletic excellence. And those are things that I don't feel from our experience that the volleyball coach was, was doing. She wasn't inspiring her players. She wasn't motivating them. She wasn't instructing them. There was a lack of communication. When we met with the volleyball coach to see what it was, you know, did she, was, she, was she just not performing? Was she horrible? What was going on? We were told it was because she couldn't get up high enough on the net. That was it. So, but my daughter had never mentioned that she had never been told that, that was the issue. So yeah, there was one left, Mr. Martin. Okay. So there was a lack of communication on the coach's part. There was a lack of motivation from on the coach's part to motivate her players to go and excel. And my understanding is that this has happened and to other players in the past. I know my sister in law experienced this when she played for as well. And my understanding there were other players throughout the years that have experienced this as well, but have not spoken up for whatever reason. So much like you know my the, the individuals came before me, I think that there does need to be a change for sure, to go and not only help this athletic program grow, but also help this district grow and help to grow our, our students as well, to help them to, to nurture them, which is what is in your mission statement. So something's got to change. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And then last week, I think, is this you, Mr. Cooper, signed up? Did no. You, no? Okay, I can't read this signature. It starts an O, I mean an R, and then a C. Anybody else in the room that signed up? <clears throat> <coughs> concludes our public um, to the parents thank you for speaking come to visit with us uh, meetings are transparent we appreciate your comments we are going through a uh, change in our athletic department and uh, administration has has listened to you tonight we've listened to you tonight and we will share that with that with the new athletic group our next item is agenda item number three AEP Transmission Line Rebuild Project Overview. I believe Mr. King is here to share some information with us. Welcome. Thank you. We appreciate the opportunity to, to be here tonight. Wanted to uh, give an update on some very important work that's been going on in this area concerning uh, some upgrades of some distribution power lines and some transmission power lines. Uh, it's going to be a, a big part of, uh, of the new year. It's going to start the biggest part of this project. So if we go to the next. Uh, my name is Patrick King. I'm with AEP Texas. And tonight I've got some experts with me today that are here to answer any questions that y'all may have throughout this, this short presentation. It's only about eight slides. So uh, I've got Wayne Rochester with me. He's also an AEP employee with our Transmission Construction Organization. I've got Brent Starr, he's the main right away agent who has been dealing with property owners and, and issues, related issues concerning property. Uh, 
I've got Roy, uh, Ray Montalago with uh, KB Power and Cody Collier with KB Power. They are the construction contractors who have uh, won the bid on this job, and they are the gentlemen that are going to be in the community. They're going to be boots on the ground every day uh, making this project happen and uh, communicating and dealing with issues that come up. <clears throat> So what we've got going on is just a quick understanding of, of the need and the overview of what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, the project that, that we're looking at includes, we're going to rebuild about a three mile line portion of, uh, of a transmission line that extends from AEP's Aransas Pass substation all the way down to the seawall substation. <clears throat> and I've got a map in the next slide we can look at this. Uh, much of the existing infrastructure consists of aging, damaged wooden structures. Uh, 50 plus years old that this line has been in, in service so it was time for it to be looked at we decided to, to rebuild it uh, based on the outage history the equipment condition and the the uh, outdated design uh, plus during Hurricane Harvey we actually lost three structures on this line uh, that we had to, we had to replace so that's when we decided to go ahead and move forward uh, with replacing it. The upgrades are going to meet modern safety standards and they're going to help reduce uh, outages and likely the duration of outages hopefully will be minimal after we get the new line built. Um, the project is going to uh, replace the existing wooden structures with steel structures and that of course is going to create a better uh, more durable scenario in case we have an, you know, an extra storm or another storm coming our way. <clears throat> And then, of course, always the project will support the growth and development of Aransas Pass and the surrounding area. Here's a, a, a pretty good map that I wanted to kind of go through just real quick. If we look, uh, I don't know if this will reach right here. See this area right here? That's, that's what we call the Aransas Pass substation. This is business 35 right here. And so that substation is out by the water burger. On, on Wheeler or, or 35, the existing line comes out of the out of that substation right there, and it hits Demery Lane and takes a 90 degree turn, and then it runs parallel with Demery Lane all the way to Avenue A. Of course, uh, A. C. Blunt Middle School is is uh, is is on Demery Lane, so this line is running parallel right in front of A. C. Blunt Middle School. When it gets to uh, when it gets to Avenue A, which is down here, it takes another 90 and goes down Avenue A to uh, which is uh, Nelson Avenue. So it's that's the line directly in front of the high school across the field here, and then it takes another 90 degree turn and then it goes all the way down Nelson. And we all know that you know the the, the brand new beautiful HT Falk or HT Falk Elementary School is is down there. And then it continues on and it, it crosses Commercial Avenue back down in here. And then it's going to end up at the Seawall substation, which is behind the HEB store, kind of tucked in that corner back there behind HEBs. So the importance of why we're here tonight is, is that this construction project is going to impact three of the APISD campuses. Of course, <laughs> and uh, our luck for the last few years. So. Yeah, and and we want to make sure that that uh, we keep y'all up to date of our plan and how we're going to accomplish this. If you want to go to the next poll or next, uh, what will the the uh, existing wooden structures uh, are going to be replaced by a, uh, the new monopole steel structures? They're going to be about 95 feet tall poles, and uh, that obviously creates uh, you know a, a working environment with heavy equipment we're going to have a lot of aerial work going on and that's what we wanted to make sure that that we're in constant communication with with the school district on any potential concerns that y'all might have if you want to go to the next slide here this is just a quick overview project schedule if you can look at right now we're at bullet number three uh, we're in the right-of-way and pre-construction activities right here. And then the next three uh, bullets are going to be happening uh, pretty quick after the first of the year. Uh, the construction is going to begin, and then our goal is, is to have this line 
built, re-energized, hopefully by mid to late summer of 2021, and then of course, potential cleanup into the fall. Uh, and then we're getting more precise on the next slide, which is the <coughs> final slide. Uh, right now, it looks like we're gonna be starting construction on the 18th. Uh, we anticipate that we're going to be working, uh, you know, Monday through Friday. We're going to try to, you know, let all of the morning traffic around the campuses, you know, go ahead and, 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 and get through and everybody, you know, get to where they need to go and start work about 10 a.m. Uh, looking at probably uh, to, to 4 p.m. We may have to adjust that, but if there's any issues with the city or uh, with the school district, we, we have a contingency plan to, to try to work weekends also in case there's some concerns. Uh, we've, we've been in, in contact with Mrs. Cook and uh, obviously Mr. Bennett, Mr. Ochoa has, has, has been on some of our internal meetings. So we appreciate the APISD staff kind of uh, we're wanting to uh, you know work with us on this. Also, Mr. Quintanilla with the city has been a big part of this 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 process. Uh, one thing that we want to do is is uh, we do know that uh, if you want to go to the next slide in the final. I'm sorry. We we've got uh, Michael Harris is always available for any questions that any of y'all may have. And then right here, the, the last bullet item on this for the public and, and the uh, residences of Aransas Pass, there is an actual website that is out there. And so it's updated if there's any, any challenges that we're experiencing, any delays that we might be experiencing, you can always go to that website. If, if you have any questions, you know, my cell phone number is available to, to each and every one of you. Uh, we've got a great team of individuals. What we want to do is, is be transparent with what we're trying to accomplish. But the first and foremost, we want to make sure that, that we're safe and we're going to work safe around these campuses. And traffic is, is already been determined. To, it's going to be a challenge. And so we want you all to know if you have any concerns or any questions or something, that we definitely want to hear from you because we, we want to try to make this as easy as is possible for everybody. So, awesome. Okay. So that's some great information. I'm glad you guys have reached out to us. I'm glad you're working with the administration and keeping us updated. Yes, and if uh, you know if, if, if any of the, of the board members have any questions as, as we progress mm -hmm. through this, you know, don't hesitate to give us a call. Well, I have one. You know, you, you're talking been friends before. If we're going by AC High School or get out of school at 3 40, so that's kind of a hot time. You've got 30, 40 minutes there. Yeah. And then when you get down about fall, they're getting out at like 2 30 or something like that. So, again, you know, I'm not sure how that's going to impact the traffic flow because there's going to be a lot of people coming in and buses running around there mm -hmm. in and out of those lots at that point. I don't know if the administration has any concerns about that or not. The, uh, the plan is, is that we're going to have road safe has looked at these uh, traffic patterns and they have uh, professional uh, uh, qualified, you know, road safety uh, set up uh, personnel. And if we have to close a lane and they, they will have, they will have people, you know, there with uh, directing one lane one way while holding up the other side of the traffic the other way. But that is definitely something that, that uh, the team here is gonna look at. And then if there's a concern with it, we're gonna try to adjust our schedule to meet the, the needs of, of the city and the school district. We wanna make sure that, that if there's any concerns that, that we, we be able to discuss it and then we're gonna try to do everything we can to, to, uh, to shift our schedule. Yeah, and, and there's been a tremendous amount of preparation work going on currently in this area with the distribution component and 
in pre preparing for this big transmission component, which is just bigger poles, bigger wires. So there's been a lot of activity, a lot of traffic, a lot of work going on. And y'all, I'm sure y'all have seen that in, in the area, uh, mostly right here on Avenue A in Emory and Nelson. Uh, so we've we've worked with, uh, with 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 our crews. Actually, there was a concern in the crews, uh, the distribution crews. Uh, we we shut down. I think about three o'clock here around the high school, and they pulled all of the traffic cones up. They got all of the equipment off the road. They opened up the road, and then about four thirty, they went back, set it back up, and started to work again. Uh, because there was a concern, you know, of, of the traffic and, and uh, you know, potential issues with it. So we, we definitely want to make sure that uh, we're talking to you and, uh, and communicating. And once we get to that point, we can provide an update to you also. Well, one, one other thing I think kind of alludes to what Adele was saying, we do have, we have resources we can utilize also. We have a call-out system. So we know when you're going to be in a work area, your administration can work with you as far as calling out those parents and letting them know on these days that there's going to be heavy construction or whatever it may be. And the, the other concern I have is there's foot traffic going around. There's a lot of kids when they see blood and walking in high school that walk down Jimmy Lane and back towards the high school and then down every way to, to go back home. And some of them even go down Nelson Lane out of the high school. So they're going to be following that route that you're going. So there's going to be a lot of kid foot traffic. I know sometimes the kids get inquisitive minds and there's going to be something out there that they're going to go take a look at, so, you know. And, and that's, that's definitely uh, something that, that the team is, is uh, going to prepare for. You know, a lot of times our crews, when, when they're, when they're uh, uh, you know, working on, on, on uh, these big projects, that they have qualified observers that are on the ground and there's some uh, vehicle kind of uh, uh, I guess uh, markings around vehicles to where you know people don't get get, get too close to them, but absolutely you know the foot traffic is going to be something that all eyes are going to have to be you know on what's going on continuously while we're working in them areas. Well, that open time that I run back and forth and random drop off in the morning, pick up in the afternoon. To me, looks like you guys got it organized pretty good. Yeah, I come through. Yeah, and and uh, you know we've got a we've got a professional uh, third-party road safe crew that looks at these projects. They look at the roads, the width of them. They they and, and they they engineer a plan, and then they have all the resources out there to try to implement it. The issue we're having, even though that this is a three-mile line, which is relatively short, it's in a well-developed part of the community. And so some of these, sometimes these smaller projects are more challenging just because of all the extenuating circumstances that we have to deal with. So yeah, there's, there's been a team of people that are looking at the work and they're going to be uh, having, you know, all of, all of the cones set up, all of the, 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 uh, the, the lanes kind of minimized in two-way traffic and personnel out there stopping traffic going one way, coming back. I do not believe there's uh, any plan to close any road at this time. Would that be a fair statement, guys? We're going to try the best that we can to keep closing in the roads. Yeah. Uh, a lot of it's going to factor into what kind of equipment we've got because the foundation design that we're using on these is a new design that we've ever used for AP. So getting equipment on site and seeing what we're working with, but we're going to try our best to make sure that we don't close any heavy road closures. Uh, if there's a possibility that there might be some short sections closed off, uh, everyone will definitely be notified to, to give advance notice to all the parents dropping and picking up kids. Yeah, and, and, and the weekends might be, you know, the best alternative that we, if we get into a, 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 complex, a, a complex area that's, you know, just going to be, be be pretty tight and maybe we need to postpone that and do it on a Saturday or a Sunday whenever you know we don't have the school traffic you know here I know a couple of weeks ago we had a massive amount of resources right here in front of the high school and on Demery uh, and we ended up uh, kind of pulling back on that and waiting till the Thanksgiving holiday the week that 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 the school was out and then they they put a massive amount of resources on that one section of line to try to uh, get it taken care of uh, 
and, and not have any issues with, with the school traffic. And if uh, I, I believe that uh, uh, Mr. Ochoa has been, been on several calls and for bus routes and things, so he's definitely connected. I know Mr. Bennett has been, been, been in the loop on some of, some of our communications. So uh, that's, that's what we want to do. We want to make sure that, that we're here to, to create a safe environment for, for the school district, for the community, and for the public. Awesome. Thank you, sir. Electrical outage and potential? No. There's no plans to, to de-energize uh, uh, any customers in this no, area. That, that is why they're doing the distribution road right now. Yeah. They're transferring it off of the transmission line that we're going to be rebuilding so we don't have any issues of any de-energization or outages. Yeah. The transmission line will be de-energized, but it'll be backfed, and so it, it from other points, and it, it won't affect any customers at all in regards to an outage. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions? Mr. King, thank you for your time. Okay, thank you all. We appreciate it. Okay. Thank you guys. Before we move on, I just, I just, I failed to tell the parents, and I, and I apologize for this. Just, I just didn't do it. The Texas Open Meetings Act, with public comments, allows citizens to make comments. It doesn't allow the board to respond. You can only respond to items that are on the agenda. Public comments aren't because we don't know what the parents are going to say or the community members' comments are going to be. So we do appreciate you being here. However, the Texas Mail Meetings Open Act does not allow us to comment or have any conversation on what you discussed with us. I just want to take a brief moment to explain that to you and apologize that I did that. Next item on the agenda is agenda item four, district recognitions. Cleaning while I talk. Um, yes, we, um, as you know, we, due to our COVID protocols, we have uh, this uh, uh, recognition via video. So I will turn it over to that. Each month during the school year, one student, one teacher, and a handful of district employees will be highlighted in a special Panther of the Month feature. We begin our Panther of the Month series for December at the district's maintenance and transportation facility to honor Arsenia Rodriguez. Uh, Araceli is another longtime employee of Randall's Pass ISD, 27 years. Am I correct, Araceli? That's right. She's seen it all. She is integral to this to this department, and uh, her just her, her people skills, her, her organization, her office management skills are outstanding. I don't say I appreciate that. So, on behalf of APISD, mm -hmm. Mrs. Cook, and the school board, we would like to present you with a certificate of employee of the month, and thank you, thank you for your dedicated service to this school district. And over at Charlie Marshall Elementary, Allison Marquez was named Student Panther of the Month, and Jerry Henderson was named Employee Panther of the Month. Jerry comes to work every day with a smile on her face and a pep in her step. She is one of the first smiling faces that students see in the morning, and she can call every student by name as she helps them out of their cars. Mrs. Henderson is always very organized and prepared, yet has been one of the most accepting of the constant changes we have had to make this year to keep our doors open for kids. Jerry is also one of the first people to say, is there anything I can do to help? And I wanted to say on behalf of me, on behalf of this team, thank you, Mrs. Henderson. Next stop is Falk Elementary, where Principal Jason Manfield did the honors of announcing our Panthers of the Month. We have a special day today. As you guys know, every single month we pick a Panther of the Month for Falk Elementary School, which is our one of the students doing the best work in the whole school. And so the reason we're here is because this month it's somebody in this classroom. I would like for Abigail Jackson to come on up here. 
Congratulations, Abigail. Abigail, every, every day, honestly, does great work, maintains excellent grades. She sets an example of what an, a top student is, and she consistently helps her friends in the classroom, turns in high quality work, and just is an overall great, great student. So good job, Abigail. You're doing awesome. We appreciate you being here and helping. And uh, we would like to present the Employee Month Award. And the Employee of the Month Award for our hardest working custodian goes to Ms. Carolina Duckworth. I have been principal here for four full years now, and this is the best custodial staff we've ever had. They keep our school spotless. Uh, they're doing an amazing job cleaning, especially under a pandemic conditions and all the extra they have to do. And under Carolina's leadership, they have been all getting along. They have lunch in here every day, and they are doing a fantastic, fantastic job. So Carolina, we thank you for your leadership. You're doing amazing. You're our employee of the month. Thank you. There you go. And there's that. Thank Okay. Thank you. AC Blunt Middle School is our next stop for our Student and Teacher Panthers of the Month. And this month, Ms. Dennis Horn has been selected as Panther of the Month for her, for her leadership and her positive attitude and always going out of her way to help other people. So please, Dennis, if you would stand up. We have a certificate here for you, Panther of the Month, and a little prize right there. Thank you. Thank you very much. One more big round of applause. Now we have an extra special announcement, guys. Mr. Hodge has been selected as the AC Blunt Middle School Employee of the Month. Mr. Hodge was nominated for Employee of the Month, and I'm sure you guys know why, for all the things that he does for you and teaches you how to cook and and you deliver food to us and, and to all the other staff members and always going above and beyond for his colleagues <laughs> and uh, always looking for ways that he can help his students out, his colleagues out, and the community at large. He's even been described as a superhero. Mm -hmm. So, well, thank you, Mr. Hodge. to make our way to the high school where Colby Scott was named the Student Panther of the Month and Spanish teacher Elia McNeil was named Employee Panther of the Month. Colby is an excellent student and a leader among his peers. He has exemplary character, he's intelligent, inquisitive during class discussion, and is always respectful. Thank you, Colby. Yeah. And we would like to recognize our employee of the month is Miss McNeil. <laughs> you have been willing to do whatever is needed in assisting the students in your classes by referring them to communities and schools, admin and counselors for support. Your desire to make a positive difference at APHS is recognized and appreciated. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> There you go. Thank you. <laughs> Our final destination takes us to the district's administration office to honor Shelly Dominguez. She does a tremendous job ensuring that our teachers have the resources and the training that they need uh, to meet all of the um, vision that the district has set. I appreciate the hard work she does each and every day. She gives 110%, and we are blessed at Aransas Pass to have her on the team. So congratulations, Ms. Dominguez. Thank you very much. We miss having them here, uh, you know, and coming up and you being able to see them personally and their families to join us. But I will tell you that it has been quite enjoyable going out on the campuses and letting their classmates and so forth uh, and their students and their uh, employees of the month to be a part of that. And you can tell it means a lot to them, a lot of emotion and a lot of hard work. So, so we are so proud of all of them. Thank you, Ms. Cook. 
The next item are the superintendent reports, and we have a long list tonight. So. 5A is a construction update. 5A1 is the rendition of the sports complex improvements. 5A2 is a review of the sports complex improvements preliminary estimate with alternative options. 5B is an enrollment report. 5C is a COVID-19 cases and district report. 5D is an update on options for CDC to reduce quarantine. And 5E is COVID-19 rapid testing. And F is student return to campus based instruction January 20th in an appeal process. I want to make sure y'all knew I was working. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't have any. <laughs> Okay, we'll try to clip through this pretty quick, but there's some very important information. Um, we're going to begin with this construction update. Todd is here this evening. Uh, he has a new rendition to show us. Um, we kind of go over some of the things with the uh, preliminary estimates. The latest uh, preliminary estimates have been put at your place because there were some uh, last minute uh, uh, items that we were able to get in uh, after the board book is published. So Todd, if you want to come up and just yes, share this information, answer any of your questions as we start moving into this project. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cook. Um, so um, I guess we um, may look at the rendering first or we're going to talk about the progress. We're, we're pretty much um, complete with the set of plans and uh, tonight we, we put everything that was in all the alternates in this new video with some additional color, a little more information, so hopefully you get a better picture of the entire project. But you want to do the rendition first? Did you agree? I, I, I thought you said you, uh, no? I've got the, I've got it, the uh, video here. Oh, but I thought perfect. you, you want to? I, I just you may go, <laughs> I, may go, I, I may go easier. We apologize. Yes. Sorry, Todd. I, I thought you may have gotten it online, but that's, Thank you. make sure that's the right, yeah, that's the right. So it's a huge file. It's, it's like 80 megabytes, or I mean, it's it's pretty hard to transfer. You may have got it on your laptop, but or on your computer, but it, it should. Wait, would you mind just quickly answering? And it's just for my knowledge. Yes, ma'am. What is materials testing? That is uh, like uh, concrete. When they pour concrete, they'll have to they'll need to have a third party test it for compression strength so it meets uh, the uh, specifications. Or if they need some do some dirt work, or they're bringing in dirt, and they need to test it, make sure it's a good sub base. It's just a third party, a, a, a budget number allowance set aside. Not necessarily we're going to use it, all of it, but we will be using some of that allowance. So I just was not sure what that was. It, it's um, it's for material testing is is that's what it's for. Mostly concrete. There's a little bit of paving that you know we've got quite a bit of paving, so there'll be some payment that we want to test, make sure it complies. Thank you. I don't know if you want to have the lights off, but... So this is at the main ticket booth. Kind of goes fast. Of course, that's the concession restroom building that's the main building on the project quite a bit of concrete paving around the building and then you can see all the fencing that uh, the four foot fencing and the six foot fencing foot sidewalk kind of towards the uh, baseball field so you can see all the new fencing there we reskinned the old maintenance building we replaced this the black water tank with a galvanized cistern <clears throat> and then um, all the backstop is going to be the 40 foot netting now and then you'll see the um, elevated cons um, bleachers and we'll go by the dugouts they're more open air with uh, split face block that wraps around those and goes all the way uh, behind the, um, the uh, backstop area. You can see we've got the center area covered. That's one of the alternates is covering the center bleacher section. There's about seats for about 300 uh, spectators, both softball and baseball. <clears throat> 
home side dugout. This is kind of an overview. It just kind of repeats itself, but it the main thing is that we're we're matching materials that we already utilized at the gymnasium, the split face and smooth face, limestone, um, the big archway, using the same materials. Um, like I said it's just going through it again. You have the ability, I believe, to look at it on your computer. It, it may you may see the colors a little bit better. Um, so I think you're missing some of the purple that we 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 have on the structures out there. In, I don't think it was in their board book, but I'll send it to you in an email. We can send a link, and you can look at it and uh, pause it and kind of kind of digest it a little bit better. The concession restroom building, of course, is set up with uh, uh, women on one end and the men on the other end, so they're totally separate. And then concession on one side and concession on the opposite side. Football and uh, baseball, softball. Got a little bit of landscaping in there. We, we put some palm trees, some site lighting, a little bit of rock here and there, just low maintenance uh, type of materials. Um, you can see we covered the, um, that's a canopy over the um, pitching, or I'm sorry, the batting cages, batting cages. So that's, that's an, that was an additional, that was an alternate as well. But like I said, if you see these uh, uh, on your computer, you'll be able to pick up, I think, more of the purple color like that we have in, uh, in the project. So, that's probably pretty much it. Um, that's, that's where we are. We're at a point where um, we're ready for a general contractor to start pricing it out. And, um, and like I said, we've set up if you have the two different sheets, we have, I think, 10 alternates set up. We may have one additional alternate. Um, I'm all happy to answer any of those questions or go through those. I have a question on that. Um, showed all the video, but the real softball, is it going to be almost identical? It, to it is identical. The, the only difference is the, the net height is 30 feet instead of 40 feet. That's just a pretty much a standard because of the weight of the softball is not going to go over that 30 feet. Um, but other than that, it's pretty much identical. Yes, sir. The, the dugouts are the same size. The furnishings are the same. The um, the bullpen is a little bit shorter because the pitching is a little bit shorter. You know, the distance to throw, but it's virtually identical. As we move further into the um, into the process with the design and the bid, we can always add additional color if we want at some point. Yes, most of uh, you know, purple is not a standard color regarding like metal building for metal building. So, but but it is for paint. So I mean, we can paint anything out there. They got the structure or anything like that. We can do. Uh, you get some purple, uh, like the wall padding and certain things. You can get in purple. If you really want purple, there they, you can special order some of the purple and the in the in the metal as well. But we we're trying to match the buildings. We're all trying to match as far as dark bronze, uh, you know, kind of what you have out there right now as far as the, the field house and some of those uh, colors. Anybody have any questions? <clears throat> They are just estimates. I tried to I tried to reach out to different contractors, uh, different manufacturers, and and projects that we have that are ongoing with other, other districts that we have actual costs for to 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 put those in this. But the the main thing now is you know we have an opportunity to have a a general contractor, construction manager at risk to actually put pencil to paper on them and, and actually get real numbers. So. Yep, so so Todd, you and I spoke earlier in the week and just, just so the board the whole board is on the same page. At at one point during the committee discussions and then when we had discussions with the board, we talked about uh, moving dirt on the baseball and softball fields 
to help with the drainage. And we talked about that at one point we did both fields, it became cost prohibitive for us to do that. But when we talked the other day, we talked about some of the, the dirt that's going to be moved, we would need to actually level out uh, from the sidewalk area back to the baseball fields. Otherwise, we would have a, was it a two foot drop? Right, right. Right now, you have you have a lot of uh, swales that it's basically carrying the water, real shallow swales that, that cut through between your football and your your baseball and softball field. So that's how the water is is taken away. It goes to your retainage pond and it goes back towards uh, Demery, that that way around the AC Blunt. This project, the drainage portion of it, you know, we're actually excavating out and putting box culverts in. So we're trying to flatten that area out and all the water's going in these drainage systems. So we're gonna have quite a bit of excess dirt. And then ideally, <clears throat> we wanna slope the fields from the backstop to the outfield. I mean, that's, that's, where you, that's where you want the water to go. And so we're, we're, we're doing a little cutting in the ball fields and the raising. And we're trying to balance, the engineers balance the material out. So it's not gonna have to import material, which is a big cost has opportunity to make your fields slope the right way and build them up. Because once we put that box culvert in, where your track is right now, and that, that all that paving that's going to be put out there for your uh, concession restroom building, that, that's going to be up at a pretty high elevation. Well, right now, your ball fields are two feet below that, pretty much. Mm -hmm. So we have to build those areas up so all that sidewalk is fairly level. And we can do that because we're excavating and reusing, repurposing that dirt. So it makes sense to go ahead and raise your ball fields at that point. Otherwise, they're kind of in a hole. And so that's 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 this portion. That that's why we're you're going to have to do probably irrigation anyway because it's in bad shape. So the only extra cost with adding that dirt in here is replacing the the red dirt. Um, and seeding, basically. So we tried. We got we got a couple of numbers uh, today, or I think this morning or yesterday, on that cost. And that was the final cost that we were waiting for. And it was about forty thousand dollars per field, rough, you know, roughly. So, does anybody else have any questions on the alternatives for the alternatives that are listed on the spreadsheet? We don't have any more questions, Todd, on that portion. Do you have anything else for us? The only thing I could say is, you know, once once we have a general contractor, you know, they want to move quickly, they're going to be able to give you realistic numbers. So we're going to be up here again uh, with similar numbers, and then y'all will pick and choose, I assume, of what you want to do. So the drawings are already set up to get the whole menu, and then y'all decide what you want to do as far as as far as the alternates. or the yeah, alternates. Right. So, Todd, we appreciate your time. Can I add, is the bleacher canopy an actual canopy, or is it a hard surface top? It's a hard surface. Yeah, it's it's uh, metal. It's pre-engineered with uh, pre-finished metal. It's yes, ma'am. Any other questions? Oh, thank you. Okay. Okay, moving on. Thank you so much for that, Todd. The next uh, <coughs> report was your enrollment report. We give to you each month. Um, you'll see um, on uh, as of 11 13, we, our enrollment was 16.53. Our attendance rate is 94.46, which is I still find quite amazing as we work through this uh, time of pandemic. Uh, so. We appreciate all that. You see all the breakdown of numbers. Any have one have any questions on that report? Remind me what we budgeted for. Sixteen thirty seven. Sixteen thirty seven. Sixteen thirty seven and we're at sixteen fifty three. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> Keep on coming. <laughs> Um, the next report is the COVID-19 cases in the district. This is posted on our website also, but this is as of 1210. Uh, you'll see that uh, this uh, is the numbers from beginning with June 21st through 1210. We have had um, 15 uh, staff members, 9 students, 
that have tested positive for COVID all were contracted outside of the school. It was not contracted within. Um, we have 12 staff members of the 15 that have re are recovered as of this time and back and six of the nine students. Um, we would of course prefer and pray that none would be affected, uh, but we feel very blessed that our numbers have continued to stay low. <laughs> say much about that because as soon as I do something will happen. Our hope and prayer um, and we're conveying that to all of our families uh, is as we go out to enjoy this time with our families and enjoy this t season to please stay safe, take care of yourselves, follow the safety protocols so that we can all come back in 2021 healthy and ready to continue uh, with our education. Um, the next uh, two pieces update on the options for CDC to reduce quarantine and COVID-19 rapid testing. I've asked uh, Mr. Bennett and Ms. McCutcheon to share information. They've been leading out in this, and so I felt they were more qualified to give us all the details on this piece and answer any of your questions. So I'm going to turn it over to them. I think we had the uh, options to reduce quarantine time first. Okay, the CDC has come out with two additional options to the 14 days for quarantine time. One is you can uh, have whomever, the students or the staff, return after 10 days without a test and no symptoms. <coughs> and or on day seven after receiving a negative test and no symptoms. We are with uh, Sally's input and uh, health department, the county, we're gonna stick with 14 days. Um, that just seems to be the safest uh, precaution. The uh, health department, Claire Rita has told Sally that she's seen people on 11, and day 11 and 12 even uh, still get it. So the safest thing for us right now is to stay with 14 days. We don't wanna get into trying to uh, stay on top of the people. If we ask them to come back at 10 days, we would then monitor for the next four days. And when you have them come back in different days, that would become uh, basically a nightmare to try to stay on top of. So that's that's our plan now. And, and Sally's here to answer any any on the medical side of these questions, but uh, or these uh, situations. But right now, that's where we are. Anybody have any questions on that one or concerns? We're good. Okay. And then the second part was the uh, COVID-19 rapid testing. Uh, Mrs. Cook told y'all about that last time. It's when the states uh, come out where they, they'll supply the schools with a, a certain amount of rapid test. That's the nasal swab and all the PPE needed to administer those tests. Um, and Again, Sally's here to answer any of the medical things. I have the information, but uh, we know that the uh, uh, accuracy of those tests is questionable, you know, uh, I guess is a good word to put it. Uh, and we are not totally relying on those, but we do have a plan to move forward with possibly u utilizing them. Um, in, in, in the rapid test, as an antigen test, we, if, when, when, Students get two or more symptoms. They're sent to the nurse. If they have two or more of the COVID symptoms, they're sending them home. Okay, they're going to go home and they have to get a doctor's uh, alternate diagnosis or a negative test before we let them come back. Uh, in, the, these, in this case, if they were to get the, that uh, diagnosis from the nurses, which we are very fortunate that we have RNs on our campuses that can make these assessments, medical assessments on these students, they can, uh, they can request or we can, we can let them know that as an option, they, have, they can go and get a rapid test here in district. Uh, but they would still go home. Uh, we still would send them home. Then if they got a negative test, we would tell them, you still need to go see your doctor, get an alternate diagnosis, and possibly get the uh, uh, molecular test out of, out of caution because because of the uh, accuracy of those tests, they're not 100%. If they got a positive test, we would send them home, of course, and then they would be in the quarantine, and we would still tell them that they, they probably uh, the best course of action is to see their doctor 
and possibly, well, we would ask them probably the best thing to do is go get a molecular test just to make sure. So in either case, and this is where we've been back and forth on it because it's, it's you know, we could go either way with it because either way we're, we're still going to send the, the kid home or the, or the staff. The staff, it's totally voluntary. If they're under 18, they have to sign a permission form and the parent does when they get there to take the test. Uh, but the one thing it would help us do is if it, there was a positive, if we got a positive on the antigen test, uh, we would start our contact tracing. And other than that, they're still going to go home. Uh, we're still going to ask them to go see their doctor and get these alternate diagnoses. But unless y'all have some major concerns or just say it's not worth the time to do it, then, then we are going to move forward. We have a plan uh, ready to go. Um, Sally, do you want to add any? Did you have any information? I was going to say, we do send them home with two symptoms that we have from the CDC, but we send them home with one symptom if it's called shortness of breath, difficulty breathing, and close contact. So there's two on these other symptoms and one on this one. So they're going home regardless after the assessment that it is something that is not normally happening to this child. So what is the advantage of us testing them? Uh, not much. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's really not. That's work in a lot of uh, keeping check contact tracing. Is that what you said was the final? Okay. Yes. If, if we had a positive, we would uh, we would send them on the way still, but we would start our contact tracing. And that's why we've been going back and forth on this for it's been about two months now. Uh, talking about it. Uh, we have Mr. Nossman here at the admin building. Uh, he and I have both taken the uh, course and been certified and Sally and her nurses will do the same and they would be administrators and uh, he would actually be the one uh, overseeing the test. And the the uh, adult can do it themselves. Uh, it's not the one that goes way back, it's just about an inch inside the nostril. Put it in a little uh, testing packet, close it, 15 minutes later you get a, get a result. We looked at this at our, at our our job as well, and we just found there was no advantages to the nurses being exposed to people directly like that that were symptomatic. And when you're already seeing them and they're doing an assessment, but as far as one on one, but when you, someone's going to go test them and, and just we just didn't find any value. If we weren't going to treat it differently, you're going home anyway. You're going to and we. And if they stayed six feet away and wore their masks, those were the questions without us actually testing. So I'd be very careful before you take on another task of something to that degree, that magnitude. Because um, it can, it, it may escalate, it may go away. Uh, who knows where we're going in the next six weeks. But it could be a full, full-time job for several people. Um, and I know this has already been a task for all of us in the district. So. What's the number of tests that are being provided to us? It's based on the hospitalization in your area, and I think uh, when we first looked, we would roughly 400 to 500 tests they would give us. And, and they have a six-month uh, shelf life, and until you reach 50% of uh, usage, they, they won't send you anymore. I, I don't know uh, how other districts are doing something similar if they are doing it at all. A lot of them are not just for those reasons. And we've really struggled with it back and forth. Do we have a real advantage of, of uh, using the test or not? And then we become the health, health services forum because they want to know just for personal reasons as well. So, um, there's, you know, and that's great. If, again, if we have the resources, I would encourage it. Otherwise, it can be a, a real big burden on the district that if we don't need to open a can of worms, then... Um, I wouldn't recommend it. it. This is a lot of people to manage, and people want if they want to get tested. Why did he get tested? Why can't I get tested? And you know, they're, they don't if they have insurance, and one of the insurances are making them pay for the tests. So we need to become that alternative, which is again a nice service, but uh, we need to make sure we're looking at the mountain that we might be carrying before we're done with it all. So. So far, we've looked at a very limited uh, criteria for it. It is only for students and staff in the district. It's not outside the community. So. Anybody else have any other comments? Okay. I 
I'm going to say how much I appreciate Mr. Bennett and Ms. McCutcheon for all that they are doing and their whole team. I mean, this has been, as you're saying, Dale, very massive undertaking. Um, and we have, we've gone back and forth, we tabled it, and we picked it up again, and it's just uh, really hard to know um, sometimes exactly how to proceed, but we appreciate your comments and the input. Um, the next piece, the final piece of my report, is the student return to campus uh, based instruction. Uh, as we discussed at an earlier board meeting, we had looked at um, postponing any push to bring all students back until the second semester. At this point, um, you know, it, it's, a, it's a real di difficult decision to make. Uh, what I put in your uh, board packet was uh, a potential letter to go out January 4th. We must give at least two weeks notice if we're going to go back to um, uh, full campus instruction. So I formulated a letter, tried to modify it to fit uh, what I felt was a better way to say this to our families. Looking at January 20th as the beginning of the second semester being the time that we would cease all <coughs> virtual learning except for those that are COVID related. You're quarantined, you have, you're COVID positive, or through an appeal process you show that you have a medical reason that would cause, could cause harm if you were on campus, uh, that potential to come in contact. Um, I gave you the document, there's also the documents for that appeal process. Um, there are several uh, area school districts that are uh, also planning uh, right after the holidays to go back to full campus and only have those certain circumstances that you would be remain virtual. There are others in the area uh, that are also continuing to um, offer both. Um, I think for us, we're watching what's happening in our area, trying to monitor because safety is a issue. But I will tell you that um, if at all possible, we need to get these kids back on campus. Um, the learning loss is monumental. Uh, it, is, it is very scary and we need to get them back on campus. We have found when you look at our, our, um, the great work the team has done, that the students are not contracting it on the campus and as long as we continue to work diligently to wear a mask, keep everything clean, social distance and so forth, uh, and that people are honest and don't come to school when they're sick. Um, I really, we really, it's showing even across the nation that the school can be one of the safest places actually to be. Um, it still scares us because we're trying to make decisions with so many unknowns and it would some, be something we will have to continue to monitor. But today, um, our team feels that uh, we are looking for your direction and you, how you're feeling today. Uh, of course, we're monitoring again when we come back on January 4th. Uh, but we would really like to move forward with bringing everyone back on January 20th. Remind me what the criteria is. I know Ingleside had to shut down their element of their junior high. Is it a 15%? What's the criteria uh, for shutting down? There, mm. Or going back to virtual? Every yeah. district is making their own. There, oh. there, there is no, there is no, <laughs> there's no, there's no, mandated guideline. No, no, I'm not saying anything. No, well, oh. no. no, every district is, uh, unfortunately, we are left out here to, we've had more local control, as I've said, in this pandemic than we have ever had. <laughs> wow. So we just get to make it up as we go along. Our, our, what we're doing is we watch it very closely. And if we see an issue, if we felt like that it was beginning to spread in the cam on the campus or causing harm, or we had lost uh, quite a few students or especially staff members, I think that seems to be uh, where we go. We're doing everything we can to keep everybody going to school. I've seen some districts, they have a couple of people out and they close down. Um, so it is all over the place. Um, I feel like the way we've been going at it, we've been very cautious, very careful. You can see we still hold the highest standards, the 14 days before people come back. They're monitoring them closely. Uh, because we do have RNs on every campus, they're very knowledgeable, they're taking care of business. Um, so, um, but yes, for a set criteria, a protocol, um, some even asked that in the superintendent's group to share. There was only one district that actually had a protocol and it was, you know, 
um, you know, just kind of a stab in the dark. Uh, everyone else is just, you have to look at each case, each situation, and then do what we think is best for us and for our community and for the safety of our students. You know, I don't, I don't think there's a right or wrong answer. It's based on what the comfort level is in the community and the board. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we address the fact of our failures and what, what that percentage was and what we were going to do to remediate them. I think we required them to come back to campus if they were failing. Was it one or two courses? Exactly what the criteria was. They were failing. Yeah, failure they were, that was just failing yeah. period. Mm -hmm. um, you know, with what, from what I'm seeing in the news and still seeing the spike, I'm not comfortable with taking that choice away from parents. We all know that the best place for the student is in the classroom. I understand that, but if a family has chosen to stay home and their, ch their child is succeeding, you know, if they have that fear, I'm still not comfortable with taking that option away from them. At this point, we're still, we're still seeing spikes in our communities, you know, here in San Patricio County and across the country. Mm -hmm. But again, that's, that's my comfort level. I kind of feel the same way like Victor. So I know I've been watching the TV, paying attention to what's going on around the world, and the spikes are just constantly going up. And I believe when we set that date for them to come back, we was under the impression that it was going to be going down. But now since it's going back up, mm -hmm. I, I got some concerns there too. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Well, is there any way we would require the kids that are actually flunking the classes that have been like the whole first semester to actually require them to come back? Just well, that kids? would be Plan B. Yes, we would need to make sure that we're very firm on that and have some very stringent. Uh, the problem is, is. Uh, uh, we're fighting quite a battle there, and that's where the issue is. Because yeah. you've got, so we will, yes, we will, we will work more. You know, yeah, there's just a lot, there's a lot of underlying there, but yes, we can try. Kara, do you, do you have a percentage of the one that's failing? Um, of the ones that are home based, we have a, at least a third. But even those that are not failing, that uh, you know, they're getting the task, but there's still things that they cannot, that interaction, the, uh, the level of, of instruction, um, they're, they're still going to be lacking. I mean, there, there's just no way online to do everything you can do in class. We're up to about 75% right now. Of our students that are back. Um, I believe it's, uh, I don't know if it's 75 percent probably about because it seemed like it, i think it was 400 i'm sorry i don't have those numbers i can send them to you in the, in the email do we have a deal <clears throat> set up like to send a message somehow to one of the parents that the student is failing or he ain't going get in or something like that the parent the teachers and the uh, uh, principals there have been constantly reaching out to these these students that are failing to make sure they understand what the consequences are and what's happening. We have started the truancy piece also, those that are not engaging, um, trying to, I think the truants, uh, they're trying to work with us a little more at first. That was one of the issues we had up until just about a, probably less than a month ago where uh, not any of the judges in the area were willing to even hear a truancy case. Uh, that seems to be tides turning a little bit with that so we can get a little more teeth in that, that would help us. Um, so um, I mean, we've had parents tell us, I will send my kid back when, you, when, when everyone's made to come back. Um, you know, it's been very bold, very, uh, you know, um, very disappointing. Uh, and it is a smaller percentage of our, of our students overall, but, um, you know, we don't want to see any of them lose out because some of their families are, because some, some of our families are not choosing to stay home because of fear of COVID, it's convenience, which is unfortunate. But it's not convenient for their education. The reason I'm saying is because uh, my grandson, uh, dad, my wife had a call, but it wasn't for my grandson, it was for my, uh, some, uh, something going on with my granddaughter. Mm -hmm. And they told her, oh, by the way, since I got you on the phone, your grandson 
haven't been on and on, he's pending these classes and everything, and, it, and we haven't been notified by anybody mm -hmm. that this was going on mm -hmm. until it wasn't even a call for us. Mm -hmm. It was they were actually looking for my granddaughter, mm -hmm. not my grandson. So. Well, I, I, I'd have to look at that individual case. I, I don't know. I do know that um, that everyone's trying to reach out to the numbers and emails and so forth that we have to work with the students. And, of course, they also correspond with them through Google Classrooms. Um, but that's why I brought this to you, because I knew the last time we spoke, you as a board did not feel comfortable with that. We had said we would look till a second semester. I'm just sharing with you that as an administrative team, our, our push was to go January 20th. If you do not feel that comfortable with that, then we will begin to work on Plan B and try to see what we can do to help these kiddos. Let's see where we're at about that time. Mm -hmm. Well, the problem is, is that we have to give two weeks notice. So if I don't give notice on January 4th, I mean, we'll, we'll just have to wait and then we'll have to just try to project out two weeks because we have to give two weeks notice before we end remote instruction uh, by TEA guidelines. So, so the question is the board's comfort level on bringing everybody back on the date that Ms. Cook has... Is that the beginning of the six weeks? Is beginning of the new semester. New what semester, okay. I mean, we, this isn't an action item, it's just a discussion to give her some direction. Uh, I'm not comfortable with bringing them back. Um, if there's anybody else that is comfortable, we need to uh, state that today so we can give them some direction that we want to move in that in that direction. I, I am fine giving, giving them, telling, asking them to come back and still following the guidelines if they're feeling bad. If they're exposed or concerned, we'll address it. But, it's, it says if they're failing and they're high risk, I think it's only behooves us to push the, the envelope a little bit. Parents do have a, you know, they're, they get to vote, they have their opinions, but like you said, you've already reached out and saw pushback on the, the percentage, and, and it's not out of concern. They're probably at the mall and at the Walmarts as well, but they can't come to school. So um, I would recommend let's open it up, my opinion, and see see how many actually don't show up. They still won't come. If, they're, if they don't want to, they won't. And then truancy can be an issue if it has to be. But, um, Is there anyone else comfortable with bringing them back? Okay. I say bring them back. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? So do I. Yeah. As long as if we watch it. But again, like I say, you, we, we can wait. You know, if we had to, we call it. If things get worse, oh, I think if you have a special board meeting, we could change our mind and, and not bring it back. But about the 4th of January is when we, when we come back to, you know, uh, just after the, the holidays, uh, to start the school back anyhow. So if we need a special board meeting, we call one and things are Expect without control, we can reevaluate that decision. If not, you know, if, if things are going down, then we can just kind of stick with that decision, make you know, make a decision at that point. Because it's, it's still over. It's almost like a month away, and the way things are doing right now, with the spikes up and down, a week makes a big difference in that curve. Well, and even in the letter, it says at the bottom, certain that if we, if there are spikes or there are certain conditions, then we would go. It would be just like what happened in March, or or. You know, there would be, there could be full closure, full remote, there could be, you know, just depends on what it looks like. Uh, the other good thing about this, this is January 20th, even though you sent it out on January 4th, this is our expectation to begin January 20th. Uh, of course, we'd be watching it that whole two weeks. That's two weeks, that's 14 days at least after the holidays. So if there's going to be another spike due to the holidays, we will begin to see that before January 20th, and then we could, you know, just because you sent the letter out with your uh, expectation to do that doesn't mean that it would happen if there was a spike and calls for concern because we would continue to watch that. Um, because it, we still remain diligent in our, uh, uh, in our pursuit of keeping everyone safe. That is not, we're not wanting to undermine that. We've come too far with that. We just believe that we can do both. And we will monitor it and if we see that it's not happening then we will immediately change course because safety has to come first and foremost. As much as we want these kids uh, to learn, we know we've got to keep them healthy and their families healthy. So um, so I, I want to just say that, that by no means was this just a, we're doing it and, and 
not going to continue to monitor this by any means. No, and again, like I addressed my fear last time, is that you know, kids flunking that semester and he continues to flunk and he's not passing, that we're going to lose some of those seniors, they're not going to be able to graduate. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to have a, that problem to face that mm -hmm. we're all those kids back another year to come back to school because, you know, we weren't being proactive enough to get them back to where we could actually get them education and get them the degree and graduate. So, and there's, again, you told, I think you said there's like 14 or 15 of the, you know, there's a pretty, pretty good group of seniors. And I look at the percentage of the, the failure rates at the high school, it was higher, it was kind of pretty high at the high school for that, you know, that first, the second six weeks, second six weeks that you took it, so. Mm -hmm. See us in direction. Okay. okay. <laughs> we'll keep you updated. Thank you. Agenda item six are the financial reports, including your board package, are the accounts payable, budget status and investment report, tax collection, the bond finance report, and the FEMA report. Anybody have any questions? There are no questions, we'll move on. Agenda item seven is the consent agenda to consider and approve the minutes of the November 9th, 2020 regular board meeting. Does anybody have any corrections? If there are no corrections, I have a motion to approve. I have a motion by Mr. Stansbury, I have a second. Second by Mr. Alvarado, all in favor please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion's approved. Agenda item eight is the action agenda. 8A is to consider and approve a tabulation of selection criteria ranking based on the construction manager and risk proposal, I'm sorry. Ranking based on construction manager at risk proposals received December 2nd, 2020 and published by APISD. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah, motion to, go ahead. I, I can go over them if you want or explain right. it or that's fine. basically um, so so that's correct we, we did publish these in the specifications that um, I'm sorry in the RFQ that was sent out for uh, general contractors and C, well, CMAR uh, we did have three um, CMAR candidates that turned in for, uh, proposal uh, uh, packets for us and then we, we sat down as a team here at the school district and went over all the different criteria percentages and ranked them based on what they submitted to the school district. Um, and what, what ended up was uh, the number one contractor ended up as being Weaver and Jacobs. Uh, they're a contractor out of Quero, Texas, and they have a, um, an office here in Corpus. Actually, their project manager that submitted on the team is Vince. He is here tonight if you have any questions for him. But I believe the, uh, the, the team that evaluated this, um, you know, had a chance to talk to them a little bit. So I think we, um, that's our evaluation of the, of the contract. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, firstly, I, I, I recognize Marcom. I know some of the work that they've done. I recognize two of the ones that built the Civic Center. We were injected is completely never heard of them. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, the, they, 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 just, uh, they just completed the Ingles, all the Ingleside projects. They built the high school there. She never said Ingleside. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> they, they've done quite a few pretty large projects in Corpus, in the Corpus area. Uh, um, they've done, I think you, you guys were responsible for GPIC? Yes, sir. A couple of projects there? Yeah, we currently have four projects going on uh, in Portland right now. And you did um, a project in Referio? Yes, sir. We do a lot of work in Referio. Um, also, uh, we're doing a project at, for West Oso uh, ISD as well. Um, we just finished up uh, two gyms for CCISD as well. Okay. They had a real strong team, and... Um, that really kind of pushed them over the edge. And you're out of Victoria? Oh, we're out of Quero, but we also have an office here in, in Corpus. Okay. Yes. Anybody have any questions? Actually, we're approving the tabulation process. Yes. So, yes, sir. 
have a motion by Mr. Stansbury to approve the tabulation of selection criteria ranking based on construction manager at risk proposals received by APISD on December the 2nd, 2020. Do I have a second? I have a second by Ms. Diasis. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion is approved. Now the next item is 8B to consider and approve entering APISD into a contract. with the construction manager at risk, Weaver and Jacobs. Do I have a motion? So moved. Have a motion by Mr. Rector, do I have a second? Second by Mr. Stansbury. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion is approved. C is to consider and approve the goals and plans for early childhood and college career and military readiness to align with the changes to the Texas Education Code required by House Bill 30. Ms. Cook. Uh, you'll see in your packet um, the information from our uh, special workshop that we had where we went over each of these areas. Um, and we made the changes uh, for the percentages that we'd all discussed. Uh, so we basically are bringing this back to you tonight for your formal approval. Also put in uh, the package uh, a, uh, a school board monitoring calendar. Um, did I put it? Yes, I think we did. Or no, I put it at your place. That's right. I'm sorry. I can't remember where I put it. Um, I didn't get it dropped in there in time. Uh, because one of the other components was to ensure that um, when we go through um, um, each of these areas that we come back to you with reporting. So uh, Ms. Dominguez looked at when we do our uh, star testing, beginning of year testing, middle year and end. Uh, and so you'll see that we put in here August uh, will be one progress measure report, October, February and June. Of course, there'll be other things that could come up. That those would be our major um, checkpoints, we would say, where we would come back to you, provide information on how we are progressing towards these goals. So I want you to have that. I'm also going to use this uh, monitoring calendar. As you see, I started going ahead and filling in, and I'll, I'll be bringing this to you probably as an uh, update here and there. Where, uh, like I already put like tax rate hearing, budget adoption, superintendent summative evaluation, some of those things that we do. I thought. It would be good for us to have a good calendar where we know what's coming up so we can stay on target, ensure that we are um, addressing uh, benchmark uh, data, that we're looking, that we're, in, we're staying in line with, uh, with ensuring that we're meeting our goals. So we had a lengthy discussion on those goals. Does anybody have any questions? There are no questions. I have a motion to approve the goals and plans for early childhood in college career military readiness to align with the changes to the Texas Education Code. So moved. I have a motion by Mr. Mullax. I have a second. I have a second by Mr. Flores. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion is approved. Thank you all for all that hard work. I know you guys put a lot of hours into it. Thank you. 8D is to consider approve offers to purchase tax sale properties included in your board package were four offers and I believe we have uh, somebody here from our tax attorney's office. Yes sir. Good evening. Welcome. Uh, thank you. My name is uh, Robert Cuevas. I'm the office manager for uh, Leinbarger, Gog, and Thorne Sampson. Mr. Salcedo couldn't be here today. Actually he's at a meeting with Woodsboro and so he asked me to come and present these offers to you uh, for consideration. I can just give you some background on a couple of them. Uh, the Robert Cooper bids, uh, I was at the city meeting um, about a month ago, and uh, he intends to clear the property and improve the, those lots uh, that build uh, homes on the properties. Uh, the other two offers um, are vacant lots. I'm not clear what they're gonna do. With, I wasn't, I'm not sure what they're gonna do with those properties, but um, 
the goal um, for these offers is to get the property back on the tax roll to somebody who's going to uh, pay the taxes going forward and then uh, hopefully improve those, those properties. And I believe Mr. Cooper, that's what he uh, stressed to the city council at that meeting. So. Does anybody have any questions on the offers? Normally, do like a fair market value. Some of this is like basically giving it to them. <laughs> um, are, are you referring really to the offers? List. Yes, the the a lot of these properties, you know, they've been taken to the courthouse steps. There was no offers for no bids from anyone uh, at the time of the original sale. And then we put that on a resale list, give it to people, and then they come in and um, make offers on properties. Um, and yes, we're asking, you know, they're, they're asking for the tax increase to forgive a lot of the taxes, but going forward, you'll have somebody who's going to pay the tax um, and hopefully improve and clear the property and clean them um, to make them more valuable. So uh, yes, the bids are low. You're, probably, you're not going to get much in terms of taxes, but <coughs> going forward. But they're um, buying this land for $100? Is that what I'm seeing? Yes, ma'am. I mean, geez, on my car for a hundred dollars. Is this a normal? I don't think I've ever recalled this. We don't have to. Yeah, no, no, that's 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 correct. It's a that's question. correct. I, I, it's it can, like it can, uh, you don't have to take the offer. I know is this Mr. the Peter? only bid we had, or is it? Yes. Sure. Where did and we did advertise it? Yes. This time. Is, it for, is this the first time it's been on the the block, to your knowledge? Yes. Anyway, we went to the courthouse steps, there was no bidders, so it goes on the resale list. And then we, once we get an offer, we'll then bring it to the taxing units for, for approval. And as we've explained it to Mr. Cooper, that particular bid, um, everyone has to agree to it. The city, the school, and county. At this point, the city's approved it. Um, There's $33,000 in taxes. That are owed against that are owed, and we're going to let him buy this land for a hundred dollars. Well, the reality, I, I get what you're saying, but the reality is that thirty-three thousand dollars you're never going to see. The the other property that has a uh, similar amount of taxes, really. In in the years past, we were we we were always trying. It's not huge. It's fifty-seven thousand dollars. I know. And Gosh, the, and the if you called me, I would have bought it for hundred dollars. <laughs> Develop the property they're wanting to build homes. Um, so that was the concern, and he went to explain that he's trying to come in, get money that's just been off the tax roll. You don't, we're not getting anything for it; it's just sitting there. There, there's going to be major improvements he's going to have to do in order to build the homes. Um, the the flip side of this is that he, we try, we go back out, we try to find somebody maybe that will do something with it, or we go ahead and get back on the tax roll with him developing it building homes, if he follows through with that and does build the homes, that definitely will increase the taxable value we, and they hopefully would be paying instead of not paying. Uh, and it could potentially bring uh, families into our district. So, um, you know, that's a lot of ifs. But right now, as I'm understanding it, um, it's sitting there and we're getting absolutely nothing for it. That's so, all. Yeah. Yeah. I can, yeah. I'm not advocating for him. I'm just letting you know that he was at the uh, city council meeting. He did his case. No, he didn't. I'm surprised he's not here. Um, and I couldn't tell you where he he he, he, had, he built a property, a house. I'm sorry, a property that impressed a couple of the council uh, people. Person, I'm sorry, the councilman. And um, again, the questions you have, the concerns about the low ball offer, what he's going to do. Uh, took him about 10 minutes to plead his case, and then they agreed to accept the offer. So, again, I'm not advocating for him. I'm just letting you know what so happened. So we don't have a, we don't ask for a low or a minimal or anything when property is valued at a certain fair market value, possibly to that, start off with and see. No. That is a good question, Nothing? and that does. Uh, I know, but as far as expectation of a bid. Something goes in foreclosure, you look at what it's valued at, and then it's what's valued at 57,000. That's where you approve it. You can just be done. He's going to be taxed. He's going to be taxed on that value. He's going to have to pay that next year. It's tax revenue choice. Yeah. Okay. Also, 
Let me just say something real quick. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm not I'm just saying. The cost of dem demolishing property, cleaning property, clearing property is factored into the bid. Now, what we started to do uh, here is, based on that meeting I had, we had a month, a month ago, was to make sure that we asked the bidder what they intended to do with the property, because that's what the council was asking. And that way, they could then, the bidder would then indicate they were it's going to cost them, let's say, 5000 to demolish and clear, or they're going to, you know, improve it and, and um, add more value to the property, more taxable value. So, um, well, and, and I understand that that's with all of these properties that we see, you know, we're getting them off the market, we're going to put them back in, put them back in. That's the standard. It's just those two bids are like insulting. They're really insulting. <laughs> yes, ma'am, I To the point where that's... I don't. I don't agree. We're not into real estate. I agree that, but we're not into giving things away. That I mean, we're going to set a precedence here that people are going to be coming in and buying it, and there is no guarantee he has to do anything to it once it's in his name, except for uh, pay taxes. Yes, ma'am, that's correct. And you know, oh. I'm not sure if this is being reported or it's out on the, the internet, but if somebody sees this particular offer and they come in with a higher bid. We stop it right there. If it's condition, if it's no condition, it's approved today. We then get the two bidders together and go with a high bid. Come back to you at a later date. So, and we've told that to them. If we get a higher bid, we're coming back. Our goal is to get maximize the amount of money that the school board, city council, and county county receives. So, there's no guarantee you're going to get it for hundred dollars. There's two more steps. This is sec this is what I told them. This is step two. So, I'm sorry. Yeah, step two. Then we have the commissioner. So. But it's like Mr. Stenberg said, you don't have to accept the offer. It's all up to you. I know that, but if this is the first time you put it on the market. <laughs> well, I can't say for the, for the amount of years that I've been on this board, that's the lowest amount that I've seen. <laughs> that's saying a lot. That's saying a lot. <laughs> also, look at the other part of it. Once they get developed, they get back to the tax rate. Start the, uh, might just want to set it. Might have to kind of set it like a minimum amount. Might have to That's the lowest I've ever seen. I've seen $50. I've seen $50 before. $50? Yeah. I'm a property owner in quality of use, you know, on the side of the bridge. And it's old. Are there other questions? Are there no other questions? Do I have a motion to approve? Bid by Angela Hurd. I'm going to see what by Angela Hurd for tax sub properties. Do I have a motion? So moved. I have one motion. Do I have a second? Second. I have a second by Mr. Director. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion is approved. Do I have a motion to approve the bid by Javier Solis? Uh, for the purchase of tax sale properties. So a motion by Mr. Director to have a second. Second. A second by Mr. Mullinac. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion is approved. Next two properties were bid by Robert Cooper. I have a motion to approve the bids Submitted by Robert Cooper for tax sale properties. So I have a motion by Mr. Director. Do I have a second? I have a second by Mr. Stansberry. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Yes. We have one opposed. Let the record reflect Ms. Diasis is voted nay. Two. Two. Mr. Two. Flores. Two. Motion is approved. He is to consider approve renewal of the membership of Walsh Gallegos Retainer Program. Can we have one more? There were four, weren't there? Did you approve both of Mr. Cooper's? Yes. Oh, yes. Okay. Okay. All right. 
Thank you very much. Merry Christmas. Merry, Merry Christmas, sir. Thank you for, for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. AD is to consider and approve the renewal membership with the Los Diego's or retainer program, their attorneys. This is pretty much a standard yearly uh, renewal. Does anybody have any questions? There are no questions. I have a motion to approve the renewal membership with Los Gallegos. A motion by Mr. Stansbury to have a second. Second by Mr. Alvarado. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion is approved. 8F is to consider and approve donations. Donation number one would be a budget amendment of $2,000 for the girls' basketball team. Ms. Cook? Um, we are bringing this to you. But we Each of the donations by policy we bring to you for consideration. Um, this is, of course, a budget amendment because it is a, um, a, a monetary um, and it's been designated to the basketball team. I uh, don't believe there was anything on the paperwork that designated exactly what it was for. But with, uh, as per policy also, we also look at these donations as they come in, make that we would put them into the system to be used in that manner, and then we would also ensure that, uh, that it does not cause any equity issues um, for Title IX purposes and uh, take care of that if, if that is, uh, is caused. But we do not feel like that would be an issue. Do I have a motion to approve the donation and budget amendment of $2,000 for the girls' basketball team? So moved. Motion by Mr. Rector to have a second. Second by Mr. Flores. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? <coughs> Motion is approved. 8F2 is to consider approved donation for custom detail package of softball helmets. Same type of issue. This is not a monetary one, so there's no budget amendment. But uh, once again, a, a great blessing from our community to, to want to help our students. A motion to consider approve the donation for the custom detail package. Motion by Mr. Flores to have a second. Second. Second by Mr. Mullinack. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Okay. The record reflect Mr. Stansbury has voted in opposition. 8G is to consider approve resolution for emergency paid sick leave extension. Good. Okay, there was some information in your board packet conti uh, uh, um, concerning this. You may remember, um, goodness, I should have looked it up back when we did this at the beginning of this uh, pandemic, um, where it was basically mandated that we would give a continuation of, regarding extension of time use due to COVID related. Um, and that is expiring at December 31st. So we received information uh, from attorneys um, that um, for best practice and to help with morale and to continuation of um, supporting our staff uh, because we do feel like they are frontline workers also that are out here uh, putting themselves at risk to continue to teach the, our children um, that we would continue to through the uh, resolution that you have in the packet um, I don't know that you want me to read that out to you you have that but basically authorizing us to continue uh, to offer that extra time um, uh, as we go into the second semester um, and not knowing what the future will hold um, to help them through this time. Basically gives them 10 days um, on top of their uh, other leave, so they use those 10 days before uh, they have to start dipping into their, um, to their leave and their sick sick time and we have some of our you know I hope none of them contracted again but um, it can become devastating for some families anybody have any questions if there are no questions I have a motion to approve the emergency resolution I'm sorry to, to approve the resolution for emergency paid sick leave extension mm -hmm. I have a motion by Ms. Diaz is that a second second by Mr. Rector all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion's approved. Next item is 8H. Consider an approved resolution establishing a COVID-19 employee appreciation incentive. 
In your packet, I've provided some information for you. I've just bring to you tonight once again on behalf of um, honoring um, the work that has been put into this year. Um, I think it goes without saying that um, we know our health care workers have put themselves out there and we, and we appreciate all that they continue to do. But we also know that um, in the school district it has been a very difficult task. Uh, we feel like our staff has risen to the occasion. They have put everything, they basically had to rebuild education in, a, in, a, in this time. Um, and with that said, um, I am bringing to you just a proposal to look at a one-time appreciation incentive payment for all APISD employees. Um, there are, I put in your packet also, uh, area school districts that are also doing this. At the time that I spoke with Mr. Galvan about this, I was not aware of any in our area, but then as we researched, we did find some, and we put that in there. You see the districts, and you see the amount that they're giving uh, at this time um, to show the appreciation and gratitude for um, all that, has, um, that they have done. Um, the recommendation, proposal number one, was a $500 for full-time staff, $250 for part-time. You see the cost of that to the district. If we did that, we have nine part-time employees uh, for your information. Um, proposal two, you see, would be a $250 for all staff and the cost. I've also put that on another page, the breakdown uh, of the cost, uh, if you uh, would so consider this. Um, also, um, we had Ms. Stansberry put together, um, when you look at where this funding would come from, of course at this point it would come from fund balance. It was not budgeted, um, but we feel our fund balance is in a healthy place. We also know that um, that our change in state revenue is our ADA, ADA increases. As uh, you had mentioned earlier, we built our budget on 1637. We're at 1653. Um, and with a 1655 enrollment, that is an additional, additional $122,969 that we will, uh, you know, um, be able to reap. Um, so that could, what normally happens when you finish out the year, you have uh, additional ADA that you budgeted below that, um, then that, once it's all goes through the books and everything, that we put that back into fund balance. So basically this would be a booking of pulling it out of fund balance at this time. And then, um, you know, our hope is that our enrollment continues to grow so that anything that you're um, um, willing to, um, approve uh, would just be repl replenished, I guess, put back in at a later time. Um, with anything, there's no guarantees for any of that. The worst case scenario would be we would pull a certain amount of money out of fund balance and it never return. Uh, that, to be totally honest, that, that's always in the realm of possibility too, but we're on a trajectory here with our enrollment that I don't, uh, I don't foresee that happening, but I like to be just totally transparent with you. Um, but I wouldn't bring this to you if I did not think this would be a very big morale boost. It would be a sign of confidence from you in their, uh, in all that they do and their commitment. Um, I know this is a big decision and not one that you take lightly um, because I know you as a board are, are very conscientious of our budget and how we spend our money. And you know I am very frugal also. But I feel that our biggest asset in our district and what helps us move forward and ensure that these students have all that they need and it will help us to become a great district for our staff. Without our staff, um, we can't get anything done. And so I humbly bring this to you tonight for your consideration um, on behalf of our, our wonderful staff members. Board, have any questions? Very well said. So I got sick. It speaks for itself. Is that like a percentage rate? I mean, when like, like 10 companies, like what I work at, they give us an incentive, but it's like uh, 1.5 you know, for the year of what you make for the year, or is it just a set rate? You wanna... Well, we did, I was just doing a set 
rate for this one time. Now when we do pay raises, we usually base that, when we do that in the budget process, we base that off of percentages uh, on the midpoint. But here, this uh, is just a one time. It's not a gift that keeps giving like a break or when you do raises in budget, you know, you continue that grows every year. This one's just a one time appreciation at that set amount, whatever amount you decide. Question or comments? Do a motion to approve a resolution establishing a, a one time COVID nineteen employee appreciation incentive. Um, Accepted proposal number one. Yeah, motion to accept proposal number one. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Mr. Director. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Uh, any opposed? Motion's approved. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Agenda item number nine is a discussion item for future meetings. Anybody have anything they want to add to the? Decal package that they want to give to the coaches. I'd like to have some details on it because the safety factors that I brought across in all my years of dealing with baseball and softball. Okay. Okay. Detail, what kind of uh, detail package for safety? What they're going to use on the helmet? Okay. Yeah, but then they're going to spray something on it, whatever, you know, could possibly deteriorate the helmet. Also, you know, you know, I've noticed, and a lot of people have noticed, that there are band, you know, uh, band members, even though they did they did well in UIL, we should congratulate them for that, for their, 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 their uh, uh, rating ones in, in, in district this year. But uh, again, second year in a row. But again, our membership is, Seems like it's dwindling down lower and lower and lower. So I, I'm not sure what the reason is, but you know, I mean, we get a report on is there something we can do to, you know, ask them is there something we can do to, from a board board perspective to help them out to try to get the membership up. I mean, yeah, you know, I mean, it just kind of, you know, most schools around here, you look at the bands and they're twice as big as ours. So, you know, it's just kind of it just concerns me a little bit because you know, 10 years ago we had. 80, 90 people in the band, you know, we're smaller. And now we don't have 25 or 30 kids in the band. So it's just, you know, it's just, just something that, to, you know, if we get a report, you know, what, what the, you know, if there's some, something they know of, the, why, why are they doing that? You know, is it something that they, they can determine? And maybe what steps they can do to try to improve it? I'd like to ask the um, administration to look into a potential bowling team since we have the, the wonderful facility here. I know it was brought up um, in social media, but uh, I don't know what it's apparently a UIL um, game. <laughs> and I don't know if we have the interest or the if it falls under like this in the, the sports. I don't know if you could look into that and okay. be real interested to see because I think we have a lot of young children that could that may not be athletically inclined but that could still be competitive in something of that, that sort that okay. since it's down the street literally right. just to kind of put some something out there to see right. what it looks like right. financially and if there's participation interest okay. but that doesn't take away from other
Earlier today, Ms. Cook and I talked about uh, the month of January being our evaluation time for superintendent, and we were working on, uh, she requested we look at the instrument that we use as compared to the one that's uh, proposed or that the commissioner has, so I'm going to we're putting that on the agenda for next month, so that will delay her evaluation for a month uh, while we look at those two as a team to see if we want to change the, uh, the instruments that we're using, so that would be on there next month. Just to let you know why you didn't get a package for her evaluation. So you have a list there. Yes. Homework. But I have to say, I'm very proud. I really thought this board meeting was going to be very, very late, but it's been a lot in less than two hours. <laughs> The next item is to convene an executive session. We do not have anything to go in executive session for. Uh, so at, at this time, it is 8.55 and this meeting is adjourned.